Hey everyone and welcome. Today's show is going to be fun. I have always had a thing for models, trains, airplanes, buildings. It's really cool. Well today we're going to do a building and we're going to do it as a birdhouse, a three-story New York City birdhouse. We're going to carve bricks, make windows. It's going to be fun. So stick around. Our three-story brownstone birdhouse begins with four panels, a front, a back, and two sides. What you see here is the beginning of the front of our birdhouse. Now, it's a little too tall and a little too wide, and I've done that on purpose. Here at the CNC machine, the first thing we want to do is cut out the brick pattern. The material that I'm using is MDF, but not any MDF. It's exterior rated. The brand name is Xterra. There are probably others. You could use solid wood. Cypress might be a good choice. If the brick pattern that you're doing is for an interior project, well, hey, no worries. Regular MDF would be great. I wanted to use MDF just because it's got that fine grain to it. And with the right bit, it's going to cut very cleanly, be stable, and will paint easily. So the bit that I'm using for all the work that you see here with the exception of our birdhouse holes, is a 1 8 inch down cut bit. A down cut because it's going to give us the cleanest possible cut with no fuzz. We're not cutting very deeply, so I'm not worried about having to extract chips from a deep hole. The 8 inch size is pretty versatile. It allows us to get into all these window and door panel areas, and I went ahead and set the mortar line for my brickwork at exactly one-eighth of an inch. The larger work, which would be the holes for the birds, is done with a standard one-quarter inch upcut router bit. And that just removes the chips very quickly and is very efficient. And also, it's got the depth we need to go all the way through a three-quarter inch panel. The setup is pretty easy for laying this out. As I said, I begin with the brickwork. So, in my drawing program, I began by drawing one brick, and then I used a rectangular array function to reproduce the brick all the way across in a row. I then started another row with the offset of the bricks, creating a half brick and a full, and reproducing that full brick all the way across. So at this point, I have a blank panel, and two rows of bricks. Then I was able to highlight my two rows of bricks and once again going back to that rectangular array function going ahead and creating a full panel of brickwork. It's pretty fast, pretty easy to do. Now in cutting out the individual bricks there are sort of two strategies you could use. One is that we could use a pocket cut highlighting all of these little mortar lines the only difficulty with that is that in order for the program to map out the G-code, these mortar lines would probably have to be about 0.126 inches, a little bit larger than the bit. And that means that the bit's going to have to track on both sides of this pocket. And that's a lot of extra cutting, and I want to make my cutting a little more efficient. So what I did was simply created an array of solid lines directly in the center of my mortar joints and then used a profile cut having the bit follow directly on top of the line. And that means one pass, fast, efficient to cut all that brickwork. It still takes a little time, but hey, there's only so much time you want to spend sitting waiting for your machine to get done. With the brickwork done, I then moved to cutting out the windows. Both the windows and the doors begin with a 3 16th inch deep pocket cut, which defines the basic opening. Once that pocket cut is done, I then did a 1 16th inch pocket cut, which creates the window panes, and in the case of our door, the recessed door panels. So it's just a series of fairly simple cuts, it goes pretty fast, and it really looks kind of fun. I'm really excited about this. So that's our front. The sides are essentially the same. We'll begin with the brickwork. We'll add windows. 
The back is going to be all brick, no windows. When I have these overall blanks done, I'm going to take a trip to the table saw and I'll miter all the joints on the corners. I'll clip the top to whatever profile that needs to be. And I'll also cut a spline in those miters because I want a good strong box. As well as dealing with the corners, at the table saw we're also going to deal with some dado cuts for panels which will create bottoms and dividers and finally a roof. So a lot to do at the CNC, a lot to do out the table saw. With the front done, I'm going to go ahead and proceed to cutting one of the sides. Once we've done all the assembly work, there are going to be some fun details to add. There'll be some lintels, some arches, some railings, some steps, all sorts of things. And you can just go to town with that if you want. But the basic structure of our three-story birdhouse begins. Four sides, all cut out of Xterra, all cut out of exterior MDF, and mostly with a 1 8 inch down cut bit. Now I mentioned before, I've got the machine set up where it's cutting on the center line using a profile cut. And I want to show you why I ended up with that. When I initially created the model for the, uh, for the brick pattern, I set up a pocket cut where all the mortar joints were pocket cuts. I like to use Vectric and then I bring it into easel to use our Inventables machine. But the translation just didn't work out very well here as you can see. It kind of turned out to be a mess. That was side one mess. And I tried again and I just went ahead and stopped it in progress. For whatever reason, the translation just wasn't working. So, woodworking being 75-80% of uh, problem solving, I went ahead and thought about how could I simplify or try a different approach of creating the brick pattern. And that's when I went ahead and went to creating a center line along all of the mortar joints and then using a profile cut. And that worked just fine. Not a problem, not a hitch. So, kind of have to be resourceful sometimes and try different things. All of our wall sections start with the brick pattern. Then, onto that, we lay on the windows, the doors, and whatever details we need. I found that to be the simplest thing to do. So here's our front again. You can drive yourself absolutely off the wall to the point where you want to just, you know, jump off a bridge trying to get all the brick details to work just like they would on a real building. It's tough. If you're doing a museum quality scale model, you might want to take the time to do that. But for most other things, really you can simplify it. A couple of things you do need to keep in mind that all your window openings and door openings should end nicely on a half brick and a full brick end. We don't want little, little small smidges of bricks to show. It just looks more planned that way. I didn't worry too much about the lower edges. I wanted to try and have a full brick, but I also knew that I'd be applying some details over that area in the end. So don't worry too much about trying to recreate things exactly as they are from real life, but capture that feel, that image that you want. And so for me, it was the tall windows, the arches, kind of really trying to get a real more sense of the vertical, being a birdhouse and three stories, and it all laid out pretty easily. The windows, as we mentioned earlier, you're going to pocket cut out about 3 16 of an inch deep, and then create the frame with another 1 16 cut. It's not fully detailed, but once again, I'm pulling some of that, you know, those small details out, keeping things simple. It's easier to paint. And for something like a birdhouse, a dollhouse, you really can go too far with the details to the point where it uh, detracts instead of adds. For most things that are outside, you want to exaggerate the details and make them more prominent and a little larger because you're viewing from a distance. And it really does make a difference. So. Don't worry about all the tiny things and making it scale and perfect. Go for the feel of it and it will serve you a lot better. Well, with the oversized panels finished up on the CNC, I've been spending some time out in the main shop doing a little bit of mill work. So let me show you what I've been up to. First off, you'll notice front and sides here, I've got dados cut for dividers to divide the different compartments for the birds, as well as a bottom and a dado that's slanted on the sides here for a roof. Each of the pieces has been mitered, 
and I've added a dado for a spline for a little extra strength and to make the assembly a little more sure. Now, of course, we cut the panels oversized. So when coming to cut these miters, I did need to make sure that I was breaking the miter at about the halfway point on the bricks so that the mortar lines wouldn't show, but the bricks would wrap properly. So we have a full face brick here, and of course, we just want an end on the edge. And that's one of those little details to think about. It's, you know, from afar, you're not going to notice, but when you get up close, you will. And that's all part of laying out the windows and laying things out so the bricks make sense. I've also trimmed things to the proper height. And as you can see on my sides, I opted to go ahead and step the brickwork down a little bit to represent the fall of the roof. And it adds a little interest up here. Now the back of our birdhouse is kind of a service entrance in a way. I've got some small corner pieces here which are going to wrap around the sides and there's a bit of a rabbit. I'm going to have a long panel in the back which fits into this rabbit and it's going to be held in place with some little brass turn buttons and that's going to be a removable panel so that we can clean the birdhouse out. The back panel is also going to have, when it's finished, holes for ventilation because that's important. We need proper ventilation within the cavities. We've got pretty much everything in hand, so let me grab my glue bottle and a glue brush and let's start gluing up the front, the sides, and these little wraparounds for the back. Now I'm going to go ahead and glue in the dividers for the compartments, but I'm not going to glue in the roof just yet. That I'm going to wait on because I need to go ahead and get the balance of this glued up and then do a little bit of trimming and fussing with things in order to get the roof panel to fit in place. Now this is not a furniture project, so we don't have to be quite as neat with the glue. My main concern is that I get all of these surfaces covered so that the glue can help seal this exterior grade MDF. Sure, it's exterior grade, but it's still MDF, and I want to make sure that all of it is well sealed, and sizing it with glue will help out. Now, being an exterior project, we do have our choices of glue. I think epoxy would be a great choice. I'm using a Type 3 right now, just for convenience. I think it's a perfectly good, appropriate glue. But epoxy is something we use more and more in the shop, and really it has a lot of great qualities, one of them being very waterproof. Now, I mentioned the ventilation for the birds. Another thing we need to think about is that the wall below the hole, the young birds need something to grip onto to help them to get out. And so what I'll do is use a little pad of window screen or some fine hardware cloth and I'll double it over and then use a couple of sheet metal screws to hold it in place against that front wall of the birdhouse. The sizes of the cavities, you know, tend to be recommended for smaller birds, uh, maybe four by four by nine or ten inches tall. For larger birds, five by five inches is very common. Right, let me get a few clamps across this. Putting out a birdhouse may seem like a simple and small thing, but I have really found there's a real need by the cavity nesting birds for birdhouses. I've got about 25 houses up, and I have all sorts of different varieties of birds. All right then, lots of clamps, but all my corners are tight and that's what I wanted. So now what I'd like to do is I'll go around and make sure that I pull out any of the little glue that might be clogging the mortar joints just for a little cleaner look at the corners. And at this point, we need to set this thing aside and move on to some detail items that are really going to make this thing special. Now, you can't see much through all these clamps, but what we're going to be adding is lentils, 
which are be up above the windows here. And that's a nice detail and really accentuates the arch. Window sills, the sills and the lintels will be a contrasting color to the brickwork. We're also gonna be adding, if we can come up to the front here. I need some steps for my door. I need some railings for the door. Up top here, there's gonna be a bit of a facade with a face and a cap and some ornamental corbels. And of course, all those lintels and all those sills. I also should think about a little doorknob and who knows, maybe even a brass kick plate. But lots of fun things to add. So we're gonna set this aside and let's move on and make a few details. So the first thing we're gonna do is cut through a quarter inch panel here. And the quarter inch panel is for some corbels. Uh, it's also for a cap for up on this facade. I've got some railings. Once we get done with that, we'll move to an eighth inch panel and cut all the different sills, lintels, and some other little parts. So I've got my one eighth inch down cut bit, great bit for this sort of thing. I'm using just some poplar that I had on hand. It's not an exterior wood, but it's got a good fine grain and I know that it's gonna be well painted, well glued, and well sealed. Well, I've made a little progress with the birdhouse, as you can see. I took it out of the clamps and I've done my paintwork and added a few details. So let's go ahead and start talking about paint because that's such an integral part of a project like this. Painting brickwork is actually really easy to do. It's just a matter of a couple of different steps. So I have a few sample boards. This is a piece of MDF cut in the same pattern as the birdhouse. The first thing we want to do is make sure that's nice and clean. Now on the show before we've talked about these Palmera brushes or a stiff nylon brush. It really works great to get some of the fuzzies out and make sure it's nice and clean. So you want to really go over everything and get rid of any of the fuzz. For the paint, I've got two shades of red. Now first let's talk a little bit about the paint. Of course it's an exterior project, at least in my case it is, and exterior paint tends to either be highly pigmented and somewhat thin or pretty heavy and gloppy and not much pigment. The paint you buy at the hardware store or house paint tends to have a very heavy, viscous uh, medium and not a lot of pigment. So let's say for red, if I bought a gallon of uh, trim paint, even if it's a good brand, I might end up putting four or five coats on and still be disappointed with the coverage. The pigment isn't there. So that's why I like to use these craft type paints that you can get at any craft store or mail order through any art store. And the reason is lots of pigment, so you get good coverage. The viscosity isn't quite so heavy, so it's not gonna build up so bad. They've got good light fastness. They're a great paint to use. And we use it in conjunction with a clear coat. But anyway, I've got two colors here, and our first step is going to be to go ahead and base coat the MDF. I'm using two colors because I want to make it a little bit mottled because one of the goals here is we have a very uniform texture with the brick. We want to break that up a little bit with our paint. And one way to do that is by using two different tones and blending them just a little bit. Use a nice wide brush. And you know what? You don't have to be super fancy about this. The paint itself is going to be sucked in quite a bit by that porous MDF and you really kind of have to just work at it and you can kind of blend your paint as you work along. Now of course I've got kind of a, a bright red and what I'd call more of a kind of a claret color, kind of a wine color, which works pretty well. I get that bit of purple in there, but you could use different colors as well depending on the brick tone that you want. If you have a building with a very more of a pink brick, well, then you might choose a little white or a little yellow to add. If you're doing more of a grimy industrial building in a city, you might want to darken things down with a little bit of black. But you really want to make sure you work that paint down in there. So I think you can see that we kind of have a two-tone effect there. That's really going to help us out. What we can do next is we can think about picking out certain bricks. And so I'm going to use a little bit of black 
and maybe just a little bit of a brown. You can just kind of vary your effects. And we'll use a small brush, I'm going to put a little bit of water on it, and you can kind of mix, create kind of a softer black. Harsh Black can be very harsh, and so it's good to, good to mix a little bit. And then we can just sort of go in and start to color certain individual bricks. And you, sometimes it's good to do a grouping. You don't have to be too fussy about this, but we just want to make sure that we're going to highlight certain bricks so that we have that, that variation because all bricks are not perfectly colored. And I say that in terms of older buildings. You know, they all were stacked and fired in methods that weren't always consistent and plus just age. But that will really help make your brickwork very interesting to look at and kind of unique if you add some different tones and some details. So anyway, you get the idea. You just want to vary it and um, don't worry about doing too much because once we get the mortar on, it's going to pull it down and it's paint. You can always go back over it if you don't like what you did. So it's kind of fun, easy, and you know what? This isn't a highly skilled technique. It's easy, so you're going to be great at it. This panel here is the same, but it's dried, and the color has darkened a little bit, as many paints will darken down. You can see I've got bricks that I've highlighted. One thing also that I've done to this panel is that I've used a clear coat on it. One of the things we want to do is we want to seal that color, because our next step is to pull out the mortar. To begin the mortar effect, I've mixed up a little bit of gray paint in this jar, and it's really very much like what we did with the, the other color. And I'm just going to go ahead and flood the surface with the paint, and once again I have a nice broad brush, and I just need to work it in. I've mixed this paint just a little bit on the thin side, so it'll flow. And once I've got the surface flooded, I'm going to want to go ahead and just remove as much excess as I can. So you can just blot your brush out on a rag or a paper towel or a piece of scrap wood. We don't want to leave big pools of this paint. Once we've done that, we're going to take a sponge or you can take like a kitchen cleaning cloth here, and we'll want to start pulling the gray off. And we're just going to pull it off of the upper surface. And sometimes it can get a little cloudy like this. You sort of have to do several different, you have to go back over it several times. So I'm, my sponge is a little saturated, so let me just go ahead and use this cloth. And we don't want too much paint, too much of the gray paint, because your, your cleaning, your sponge or your cleaning cloth will tend to pull it out of the joints and then you'll never get it clean. But as you can see here, that's pretty good. I'm going to let this dry just a little bit and I'll want to go back over it again. If you do find you get a bit of a gray haze when things have dried, you can always take either a roller or a brush. I like to use just a brush that's very dry so it doesn't have too much paint on it and you can always kind of go back over things and add a little bit of pure color and really start pull that red back that might be a little bit hazy. So there's plenty of time and plenty of opportunity for you to go back and create the effect you want. So once I had the brickwork completed on the building, it was time to start working with details. That's kind of fun. So I went ahead and I added my uh, corbels up top, and I added the sills, the lintels. I pre-painted, pre-sealed, and then glued them on with a CA glue. The CA works pretty well because it reacts with the uh, pH of the differing surfaces rather than a solvent having to dry. So it grabbed very quickly and did a nice job. The steps 
This is simply a block of MDF that I took to the table saw and cut the steps in. The railings you saw were cut on the CNC machine and they're fixed to the steps. They go into a hole with plenty of glue in there. And finally we've got a little bit of an awning over the doorway. So pretty simple to do. I love the details because they just really start giving the whole effect of the building and add a lot of three-dimensionality to it. With those in place, I did go back in and did some painting on the windows. I made sure that my gray mortar color was all the way around the interior of the window. I then used uh, my green paint primarily on the surface but also along all the edges of my windows and then use just sort of a blend of the light blue and a white for the glass. You know, glass has no real color to itself. It is reflecting the scenery around it. So it's kind of up to you how you want to deal with the glass. I decided for an outdoor piece that to use a blue for the sky, pull in some white, make a little model. That made sense to me, but you might try some different things as well. The top of my building I opted to go ahead and paint black and so I put a couple of coats on it and I also did that on the bottom as well. Now let's look at the back here. We need a removable panel in order to clean and have access to the cavities. This panel is rabbited and mates to these rabbits on our sides here. And I also have some dados cut so it will engage these floor dividers. It's going to be held on with some simple brass screws, although some little thumb tabs will be fine too. They're used for, uh, for picture framing work and also for holding uh, screens and windows. You'll notice these six holes here. These are ventilation holes that we talked about earlier. And that's important that the cavities have plenty of ventilation. One step that I haven't done yet that we also mentioned was the need for a little bit of screening up against the front wall below the opening so that young birds can easily climb up. Sometimes the birds just fill everything full with nesting material, but it's always good to have uh, some kind of medium that the birds can grip. So I'm going to use a very fine hardware cloth. I'll fold it over so that the folded edge is underneath the hole and that way there's no sharp edges or sharp ends of the screening. I think to mount my birdhouse, what I'm going to do is use a galvanized flange that's used for water pipe and then a short length of water pipe under the ground. Because I want to be able to take this in. Because it is kind of an art piece and with all the paint, I'm going to leave it out during the good weather but when the birds are gone, when it starts getting ugly out, I'm going to bring it in and then I'll put it out the next spring. If you wanted to, you could also just create a large, uh, maybe a double layer block of MDF and put that on the bottom with a hole drilled in it and simply set it on top of a pipe. Plenty of ways to mount the birdhouse. One thing that's going to be critical to the longevity of the finish, the longevity of the birdhouse, is that you seal everything up. So, what I have found is that there are a lot of great products available now that are water-based and exterior rated. The one that I've used for this birdhouse is a product by Modern Masters. You'll forgive the white overspray on everything, but it's their dead flat exterior varnish. It's an easy to apply water-based finish. There are plenty of other manufacturers. It's important that you use anywhere from three to five coats to finish everything. Now, it may sound crazy, that many coats, but film thickness matters when we're talking about exterior finishes. That's true of a varnish, it's true of a paint. Film thickness matters, and it's just multiple coats that are going to give you that. When you use a clear finish on a project like this with lots of ins and outs, you need to be careful not to let the varnish pool anywhere because if you let it pool and it's super thick it tends not to dry clear but dries white and can crack. So that, that you know, constant pecking technique with the brush that you used to, for the brickwork, well you're going to do that with the, uh, 
the clear coat as well. It takes a little bit of time, but it's not bad to do. And once it's sealed up, you'll be surprised at how well it will protect everything. So that completes our project. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been great fun and you know all the techniques that we've shown here will apply for a birdhouse but they'll apply just as well for a model railroad layout, for a beautiful barn, for your kids briar horses, whatever it is you want to do. It's a lot of fun so think about your CNC machine when it comes to architectural details, brickwork and uh, good luck with your project. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time. Well, the brickwork that we did for the birdhouse is super fun and it's easy to do. So I thought you might enjoy seeing some stonework as a different kind of texture, a different kind of medium for building your structures with. So the stonework is pretty simple. Now you can take a marker and draw your individual stones for your design. What I've done here is I've gone to the internet and I found a couple of drawings that were just right that I thought would work well in a translation with our VCARF program that we could then cut with the CNC machine. So let's go over to the computer and you can see this is a drawing of a stone wall that I found and I liked it because it's got a pretty crisp clear definition of where the mortar joints are and that's important. Here you can see that is that same stone wall only it's in VCARV and I converted it from a bitmap to a vector file, which is what we need. So you can see I've got the, all the mortar work there. What I thought I would do in order to create this uh, stone wall is to break it apart into a texture, a background texture, and then v-carve the individual mortar work. So v-carve does in fact have a texturing program and Here's some of the parameters for it. And now let's go ahead and take a look at our 3D view. So you can see here that we now have a texture in our preliminary view here and we have the V carving. But the texturing is interesting. That is done entirely with a ball nose bit. Now I've got a couple of bits here. This is a one quarter inch ball nose that you may already have for use in carving work and here is a core box bit which you may already have a couple of sizes and here is a 60 degree V carve. I like to use the 60 degree because it shows a little more detail because it produces a nice sharp crisp differentiation between the mortar joint and the face of the stone. So let's look at two examples that I made earlier. Here is one using a different pattern of stonework that I pulled off the web and you can see here we have a quarter inch bit which is using the texture program from VCarve as a background and here we have the 60 degree VCarving bit pulling the individual stones out. This pattern here is the one that we just looked at on VCarve. Once again, it's the quarter inch textural pattern and the 60 degree V bit. In terms of finishing, I'm going to treat it very much like we did the brickwork. I'll use a background color, I'll pull out individual stones, then we'll go flood the whole area with the mortar color and wipe it off. And then we can go back, touch up and highlight everything kind of get rid of any grayish or wash that might appear over it and I think we'll get some fantastic stone effect. So let's go ahead and see now how we'll actually make it. I have a piece of MDF in the machine right now and I have a half inch core box bit and I'm going to do a slightly coarser pattern for the texture because those quarter inch bits they took a little bit of time. For my 12 by 12 samples it took about two hours to produce that texture. So one advantage of a larger bit it's a little bit faster and I kind of like the coarser look anyhow. Well there's our completed panel. It's a pretty simple process really. You can capture some stonework from a drawing off the web or create your own. Scan it into your programming go from a bitmap to a vector file. 
And then it's a simple matter of setting up two different cutting files, one to produce the texture, and then a V-carving file, which will define each of the stones. It's a lot of fun, a lot of possibilities.